Hi guys, in this video, we're going to see yet another neural network that you probably already know. So this neural network will be logistic regression. And we will show that even logistic regression can be expressed in terms of a neural network. So let's dive in and see what are the differences between logistic regression in the GLM framework and as a neural network. So logistic regression is basically a form of binary classification problem. Okay, you assume that your y's, your response variables, distributes Bernoulli, uh, they are either zero or one, you usually code it with zero or one. Sometimes you can code it with minus one and one, but for regular logistic regression with zero and one. And you assume that the mean, the, the probability is affected by the axis, by the covariance. In GLMs, so I have a whole series about it. You should maybe check it out if you haven't already, uh, we assume that the link function, not the mean itself, but some function of the mean is some linear combination of the covariates and some coefficients. So here, usually the link function for logistic regression is the logit, is the log of p divided by one minus p. The main reason we do this is so that this quantity will be unconstrained. Yeah, so p is between zero and one, right? So p has to be uh, between zero and one. And this term over here will almost certainly won't be between zero and one. It is unconstrained. It will be between minus infinity and infinity. So we want to somehow change the quantity that we have to be unconstrained. We take p divided by one minus p. This quantity is between zero and infinity. And then we take the log of it. And now it's between minus infinity and infinity. This is the main reason why we um, take the, this link function. And then if we invert the link function, so p is actually the inverse of the logit, which is actually the sigmoid. Uh, so if you have an x, for a given x, p is equal to um, e to the power of x transpose beta uh, divided by 1 plus e to the power of x transpose beta. And here, the beta also includes the beta 0, and x also includes 1 for the intercept. OK, so how do you solve this? Uh, in the GLM framework, unlike linear regression, there is no closed form solution. Uh, but you can still try to maximize the log likelihood. So this is the likelihood, right? You express each observation uh, of the Bernoulli like this. And then you take the product of this over all your observation. You assume independence of your data. And we said that the p of xi's are basically can be expressed with this inverse link function. You plug that in, and then you take the log of it, and you come to this expression over here. I'm going over this pretty fast, but uh, again, you should check out my GLM series uh, for more information. OK, so we have this log likelihood, and then we want to maximize it. The way you do this in GLM is usually by Fisher scoring which is a variant of Newton method. And Newton method is a second order gradient method. So it's similar to a gradient ascent or gradient descent. But you also use the second derivative. You use the Hessian matrix. Yes, so you take the second derivative of this log likelihood. Uh, you invert it. Uh, and then you multiply this by the gradient. And you take a step in that direction. And this is newton raphson Fisher scoring just approximates this Hessian using the expectation of the negative uh, hashing. OK, I have a video about this. You should check it out. So this is how you solve it in the GLM framework. How can we express this as a neural network? Again, let's suppose our axis is uh, two-dimensional. Uh, the architecture we will use is, again, a single layer, no hidden layers. Uh, but this time, not only the linear uh, uh, operation, but also we'll add the activation function and we'll add the sigmoid activation function. So the sigmoid activation function just means take the input. Uh, and if your input is x, just pass it through this function. OK, and this is how it looks. So if this is x, this is sigma of x. This is the sigmoid of x. OK, and you can see that when you go to negative, you're basically 0. When uh, you pass some threshold, you are basically one, and there is a small area where you kind of go from zero to one uh, in the middle. Okay, so again, you have x1, x2, um, maybe a bias term, 
you multiply it by W1, W2, and maybe W0 or a bias. Okay, and then you take the activation. Yeah, you take this sigma over here and you give the output. Okay, so the output of the neural network will look something like this. But notice that this is exactly this thing over here. Yeah, this is exactly uh, the inverse link function. Okay, so the output of the neural network actually gives you the expected p for that x. Okay. And so this was the architecture. The second component is the loss. We will use the binary cross entropy loss, which looks something like this. But now if we plug this in, instead of the y hat, we get this thing over here. But this is exactly this expression over here from the GLM framework. The only difference is that here we have a plus and here we have a minus. So this is the only difference. Here we are trying to minimize the negative uh, binary cross entropy loss, uh, which is this expression. So we want to minimize this expression. And here we want to maximize this expression without uh, the minus in front of it. So it's exactly the same. And so the architecture allows us to express exactly the same model. The loss allows us to express exactly the same objective function. The only little difference is the optimization. So instead of Fisher scoring, which is what you use in the GLM framework, in neural network, we will use gradient descent. Yeah, we will use stochastic gradient descent or some variant of it like momentum, atom, etc. OK, so let's code this up. Uh, I here use the same imports from before. I add two imports to it. One is the statsmodel.api. Uh, and this is so that I can run the GLM framework. This already implements the Fisher scoring algorithm, and it helps me do it without actually coding it up. And it requires that I give the data as a pandas data frame, so I also import pandas. But the rest is exactly like in the last video. We generate the data. I take 1,000 points, and again, x is two-dimensional. I take a uniform between minus 3 and minus 3 to 3 and 3. So it's a two-dimensional uh, two uniform box, basically. And I sample n samples from it. I already add a columns of 1 to make this a design matrix. And these are my true parameters, my true weights. And so I just take the multiplication of this to get the logit. So this is the, so this is the linear term. And in order to transform this to P, I have to take the sigmoid of it. OK, so I can define the sigmoid function like this. And then I can just take the sigmoid over the logits, and I get the Ps. And if I scatter the Ps, you can see that it looks like the sigmoid activation. Yes, yeah? so for some Ps, for some Xs, you get a really big uh, logit. And then when you pass it through the sigmoid, you get that it's almost one. For some, you get a very uh, small logit, a very negative logit. And then when you pass it through the sigmoid, you get close to zero. And for some things in the middle, you get uh, something is in the middle. OK, now to create the data, I'm just going to sample from a Bernoulli distribution and give it the p's, the probabilities. I could have also, instead of defining the sigmoid and creating the p, I could have already just give it the logits, and it knows how to do it itself. But for the purpose of understanding, I also uh, showed you how you can create the Ps. And now if we scatter it, we can see that for uh, observations with very large logit, their Ps were almost 1. So they almost certainly got 1. And the vice versa, yeah, with some observation that had a very low logit, their p's were almost 0, and so they almost certainly got zeros. And then for the ones in the middle, well, here you get more zeros than 1, but as you go further, you get more 1s than zeros. OK, so this is the plot that I expected to have. Now I'm just going to uh, change my y's, my 0 and 1s, to be a data frame, and also my x's to be a data frame. Uh, a pandas data frame. And this is the input I will give to the um, stats model API with, uh, I will call sm.glm, give it the y's, give it the x's, and say that I want it to be a binomial family. I will fit 
the model. And so this basically does the Fisher scoring or the Newton Raphson method. And now I can print the results. Okay, so we can see that uh, it took seven iterations of Fisher scoring. Uh, the rest is not so important. Uh, we can see that the link was the logit and it gives us the coefficients. Yeah, so it gives us 0 0.4 minus 0 0.9 and two. So pretty close to the 0 0.3, right? The true parameters were 0 0.3 minus one and two. And this gives us 0 0.4 minus 0 0.9 and two. And you can also just access the parameters. You don't have to print this whole table. Okay, now let's do everything just with neural networks. This time it requires a bit more of a work. It's not just one line like in the last video. I think the default way to do this is to define a class and give it some name. So this can be my network or logistic regression network or whatever. I just called it net. And we want it to inherit from NN module. We define the init module and just call super init. It just says, okay, go to this class and do whatever the init there asks you. And then we just define one layer, a linear layer. And we say it takes two as input and gives one as output. I could have also defined another layer as the activation layer. So I could have said self.sigmoid is equal to nn.sigmoid and make it an extra layer. Instead, I just decided to use it as an operation and not as a separate layer. I'm not sure what is best, but it's both ways that you can do it. So this is one uh, function you have to implement in this class. The second function is the forward class. Uh, uh, which takes the input and then you just say, okay, pass it through the linear layer and then pass it through the activation function. And this is your Y hat, and then you just return it. So doing this will define the architecture. Then we just instantiate this architecture. So, and that's it. We have our neural network architecture, just not trained yet. We define the loss. I define it to be the binary cross entropy loss. An optimizer, just like before, will take a stochastic gradient descent and give it the parameters of the network and a learning rate. And then we do the training. In this case, I take 10,000 steps uh, just because I experimented with it a bit and you need a bit more steps in this case. Uh, but this is also a very naive implementation. Yeah, I don't check for anything. I don't check for convergence of the network. I just say, okay, run for 10,000 steps and we'll see what you got. So again, every iteration, I zero the gradients. I do forward propagation, I compute the loss, I do back propagation, and I tell the optimizer to take a step in the direction of the gradients. So let's run this. Okay, and now let's see what the parameters are. So 0 0.41 minus 0 0.94 and 1.99, almost exactly like we got using the GLM framework, but here it took us about 10,000 uh, steps or 10,000 iterations. Uh, maybe we could have done it less if we used a better optimizer instead of stochastic gradient descent, maybe Adam. Uh, if we uh, used some more smart training, maybe we could have reduced it, but it's nowhere near the seven iterations that we used using the GLM framework. However, here it also had to calculate the Hessian matrix or the expected Hessian matrix, yeah? so. It's not exactly that it only did seven operations or seven iteration, it also had additional computations, but still overall, I think uh, the GLM frameworks work better for the problems of GLMs. But this is just to show you that they can also be expressed in neural networks and they can also be solved using these very simple neural networks. So this is all for this video. I hope you enjoyed and see you in the next one.